Welcome everybody to Pieces of China, a China Institute program which tells the story of China one object or thing or trip at a time. And my name is Dinda Elliott. I'm the director of programs at China Institute. And we are so thrilled today to have uh, Ambassador Nicholas Platt with us. Um, Ambassador Platt, I would say, is one of the wisest, whom I've, no I've known for many, many years, but he is truly one of the wisest and most experienced China watchers um, in the United States. And uh, he spent 34 years in the Foreign Service uh, after his studies in Taiwan, uh, where all the great uh, American diplomats were trained back in the day. Uh, he went to, he started his service in Hong Kong uh, he accompanied Richard Nixon on the famous 1972 trip. He was in the liaison office, helped establish the liaison office in Beijing in 1973, uh, and continued to serve as a diplomat for many years, including serving as ambassador to Zambia and the Philippines. Um, after that, Ambassador Platt spent 12 years at the helm of the Asia Society, uh, where he is now President Emeritus. And um, I will also say that uh, Nick wrote a wonderful, wonderful memoir called China Boys, which really tells the whole story of his experience and, um, you know, leads us through the U.S.-China uh, diplomatic relationship. And it's really a must read. So go out and buy it, China Boys. Um, so Ambassador Platt, welcome. We're so delighted to have you. Well, I'm very glad to be here. So Ambassador I have Platt. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for Dinda, whose engagement with China has been long term and very, very intelligent. <laughs> Thank you for that. So Ambassador Platt is going to talk to us today about the 1973 trip by the Philadelphia Orchestra to China. And so I forgive me the dog in the background. I'm sorry about that. It's the age of Zoom. Um, so let's let's take a look at um, a couple of the slides. First, um, Ambassador, tell us a little bit about that Philadelphia Orchestra trip. Why was the State Department even involved in organizing it? And what was the importance of that date, 1973? What was going on at that time? There's, there's the picture of the orchestra playing in Beijing. Well, I think the, the, in the opening of relations and development of relations with various countries, Music, music exchange has always been a traditional part. Uh, Ormandy himself wanted to be his orchestra, to be the first orchestra to visit the People's Republic. And he started um, lobbying President Nixon uh, for this privilege. And um, President Nixon agreed and, and then turned over the management of it from the American side to the, to the brand new liaison office in, um, in Beijing. And I was there, I had been sent among others to go and, and, and set this up. And I think there's a very important point here. There really were two openings to China. One was the Nixon trip, which gave us the beginnings of a, uh, of a formal relationship. And, and then there was the establishment of, of the liaison offices. Um, the Nixon trip started, started relations and made relations between the US and China okay. It was, it was now okay for us to be together. Mm -hmm. And it was a matter of such sensitivity that during the Nixon trip, we, we, we didn't really have a chance to see people, the Chinese people. We saw the people who had been picked to sit next to us at dinner, et cetera, et cetera. But um, when we drove from the airport to the, to the guest house, uh, and on that day in, 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 in 1972, um, there was nobody there. <laughs> Let's look. I think we have a photograph of, of that trip. Can we look at that, Aaron? Yep. There, well, no, there's another one, right? That's me and, and Madame Mao. 
who who was in charge. That's a good picture of her. But in any case, um, the people to people part of the relationship began in 73, the mm -hmm. year that this was taken, picture of me and Joan Lai. Um, and it was an extraordinary year. We were brand new in Beijing, but the curiosity level on both sides was so high that um, a whole range of different visits occurred mm -hmm. in, ba in banking and, and trade and uh, uh, aircraft and all kinds of different areas. And there were young, young people's delegations going back and forth. Yeah. And there was, it was just a frenzy of getting to know you. Right. So the next slide we included just to because we wanted to kind of for the audience set the stage to just remind people that in 1973, I mean, China was, of course, at that moment starting to come out of the extreme, the most extreme turmoil of the Cultural Revolution. But it was still Cultural Revolution times and the musicians had been were off in the countryside, uh, you know, doing farming work and they were just coming back to their um, original professions as musicians. So, so Nick, tell us a little bit about um, the Ormandy trip itself and, and what were some of the complications in terms of figuring out what the, uh, you know, what the performances would be, et cetera. It was not, a, it was not entirely smooth sailing, right? No, it was not. And uh, we had been talking to the Chinese about the programs that were going to be played, and the Chinese were very sensitive about about the um, the materials. They they figured that some some pieces like the afternoon of a fawn and so on and so forth uh, were pr prurient and not uh, <laughs> not accessible and and sh shouldn't be played. Um, one. One piece that, that Madame Mao kept insisting on was uh, Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, and Ormandy made it clear at the outset he wouldn't play, he wouldn't play it. He didn't like it, and uh, he 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 liked to establish himself as 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 an authoritarian figure, and so did she. Anyway, <laughs> the the, play, the plane was. In the, in the air and about to land, um, and the musical officials came to me and said, "We have a high-level um, request from the leadership that he play uh, Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, the Pastoral Symphony." So there I was. I didn't know Ormandy, uh, but here was a, a, a major obstacle. And, and um, Madame Mao, of course, was, was a f fierce character in those days. And um, all of the Chinese officials were scared to death of her. Anyway. So what kind of maneuvering did you do? Well, I, I got, I was, I had gone to Shanghai to meet the plane and to accompany the orchestra to to Beijing, and that's a two-hour ride, and I thought that would give me a chance to smooth over any difficulties. So here I am. I say to Ormandy, I'm sitting next to him. He's a tiny man, by the way. Um, Maestro, we have a request from the very top to let you play Beethoven six. He said, I hate that symphony. And uh, I told them that I wasn't going to play it and I didn't bring any scores. And I said, well, let me explain to you why they're so interested in this. The Chinese communists came to power on the back of a, um, of a peasant revolution. And uh, they've always touted the fact that their political clout is based on uh, is based on appeal to the to the to the farmers, and of course, in those days, farmers were eighty percent of the population. 
You're basically making all this stuff up at this point, right? As you're talking to Eugene Ormandy. My lips are flapping at warp speed. And, <laughs> and, and, and I am I am ma I am making this up. Um, but Ormandy looks at me and rolls his eyes and he says, okay, when in Rome, I will I will do what the Romans want. And I breathed a huge sigh of relief because I knew that um, this was a major obstacle and we just put it aside. We got scores from Beijing and from Shanghai and they played, they, they played it beautifully. Um, now, you know, the Philadelphia Orchestra is really good at music, but it's also very good at people to people um, relationships. And they hadn't the been in Beijing. They hadn't been in Beijing for 10 minutes before they had their frisbees out and so forth. And Chinese had never seen a frisbee before. And they were absolutely riveted to this. And uh, so the, 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 mu the music part was very important. And the, and the Chinese like Western classical music, but they also like wanted to get to know us. Mm -hmm. And so this was all part and parcel of it. Um, I and my wife, Sheila, who was who knew music and knew the language, uh, were detailed to be with the Ormandies the whole time they were there, asking, answering their questions and so forth. And mind you, they were very, very curious about China. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they were just as apprehensive about it as we were. But right. as they went along and visits to the orchestras between the, between the orchestras proceeded and <clears throat> we had four concerts in Beijing. <coughs> As that went on, um, people loosened up and really started to enjoy themselves. Yeah. Um, the um, here's Ormandy with Lee De Lun, who was their their very highly respected conductor, respected not only for his musical skills but for his political skills. Anyway, these, these are this, these kind of- Interesting. And when you say political skills, you mean in terms of protecting the orchestra or? Protecting the orchestra, protecting the musicians mm -hmm. um, and uh, protecting the, the music. So anyway, we, so we were talking to each other as well as playing for each other. Yes. And the, the, the concerts, the, the concerts were, were well received, although the Chinese were very quiet about uh, public applause and so forth. Right. I was called back to backstage after, during the first concert when, and they said, you know, Ormandy's going bananas, uh, come back and help us with this. And Ormandy, <laughs> Ormandy, was very disappointed in the public applause um, reaction. And I said, look, Maestro, this is the first time the Chinese have heard an American orchestra. And normally they're not very responsive anyway. I, I can pro I promise you that, that this is a, what they've given you is, is the Chinese equivalent of a standing ovation. Um, so just cool off and, you know, play your music. <laughs> anyway. so, so as you look back at this, um, talk a little bit about the sort of cultural and political significance of this. This was really, you know, one of the first major cultural exchanges and, uh, you know, a lot has happened since. So what was the significance of this trip? Well, it, it, it proved to be lasting and important. Um, and the, the orchestra took a long time taking advantage of this. Um, 
And for, for some 19 years, they didn't do anything except celebrate anniversaries of concerts and so forth. But then in 20, 2010, 2011, their leadership came to me and said, we need to establish some kind of formal program because they really want this. This is for the Philadelphia Orchestra. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Philadelphia wanted it, but the yeah. Chinese wanted it too. Yeah. And so we put, put together a program, put them together, and it has lasted to this day, even though we've had severe ups and downs in other parts of the relationship. Right. Uh, and I think that what's happened is, I mean, the Chinese, the Chinese really like Western music and Western orchestration. And you can ask yourself why this is, and it's so much, it's grand, it's beautiful, it's abstract, it's a lot of things that their own music is not. Their own music is very beautiful, but it's what, what we call program music, music that describes an event or uh, something real. Mm -hmm. And this was another selling point with, with Ormandy. I said, you gotta realize these people really like program music mm -hmm. and Beethoven's Six is an important piece of program music, which mm -hmm. describes the life of the peasantry. So. Fascinating. And of course, you know, classical music, Western classical music has absolutely taken off in China. And China, you know, one might argue China is going to save Western classical music for the world, right? Because as audiences are shrinking here, they're growing in China. That's right. And it's very, it's very, uh, what's the right word, fashionable to have for your children to have music lessons. And when you can consider that there are a hundred million, hundreds of millions of Chinese youth who are taking lessons, um, well, you can see why, I mean, when you go to a, a concert in America, the orchestra's got, I mean, the audience has mostly got white hair. Yes, yes. Not so, not so in, 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 in China. Mm -hmm. They see the economy has grown exponentially and they can afford the, the, the lessons and they can afford to go to the concerts. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we're not the only ones in the game. I mean, there are other major orchestras from Europe and, and from the United States that tour regularly, but we're, we, the Philadelphia Orchestra, are much more systematic and have uh, a real teaching program. It's an amazing legacy. Um, so I want to ask you now um, to step back a little bit and look at, because you've been watching China ever since, you know, long before 1972 even. So you've seen it all. And we are now facing, we're in a time of extremely strained relations between the United States and China. And I just want to ask you to talk a little bit about I'm curious as to whether you're an optimist. Do you think that we will find a way to work together and uh, get through these difficult times? Given you've you've got basically the rise of the second world power, and you know historically when a second world power has arisen, there it hasn't led to a very happy ending. Um, and I'm really curious as to whether you think that we will find a way of sorting our sorting our way through this. Um, I'm quite optimistic. I mean, I'm. We're both too big to ignore each other. And I know for a fact that Chinese and Americans talk to each other every day, uh, officials, um, because they have to. I mean, can you imagine our top banking officials not saying, talking to each other every day and comparing notes and and providing advice to each other. Um, I think that the, the, the musical uh, connection is one big, 
because they both they both like the the, the music uh, and the people like the music. Uh, but you also have to remember that Madame Xi Jinping is a professional musician, and uh, you know she 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 was a singer, a major singer of of of, of military songs much better known to the Chinese people than Xi Jinping uh, before he was named. And, but, but in, as far as economics are concerned, as far as trade is concerned, I mean, can you imagine Chinese and Americans not talking to each other today about, you know, the supply chain? and about the shortages and so on and so forth. So Mr. Xi has ramped up the rhetoric uh, and made us all quite uncomfortable. Um, but the people who have a legitimate reason for operational reasons to be in touch with their Chinese counterparts simply do, are simply doing it, you know. So we're just we're just too integrated. We're so integrated at this point. Yeah, and the idea of decoupling is uh, ridiculous, ridiculous and undoable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, rhetoric sets the tone, and so on and so forth. And Mr. Xi is very interested in, in presenting Chinese communist communism as as a superior system. The Americans are just being practical. I mean, with someone that big who makes that many things that we want and need, you have to have contact. So this is this is going to prevail. Yeah. The tone um, and, and it, it is not good, but it's going to prevail. A final thought on cultural exchange, you know, as you know, China Institute, we're very much involved in kind of trying to add complexity to the to people's understanding of China, just to add complexity and nuance. Um, and a lot of it, that is through exploring the culture, complex culture of China, etc. You know, do you think that that cultural exchange can help us get through this difficult moment? It, it is. It's doing that, uh, and it's doing that in a very, um, how would I say, quiet way. But the 50th anniversary of the Nixon Mao visit is coming up. Yep. The Chinese want very much to celebrate that. And uh, we should um, we should help them do that. That's a great way to end this conversation. Um, Ambassador Nicholas Platt, thank you so much for adding to our understanding of Chinese history. And um, you've seen it all. So you've really, uh, we've all learned a lot today. And I wanna thank our audience for tuning in. Please become members of China Institute because your membership helps us to bring amazing speakers like Ambassador Platt. So we hope to bring you back to our stage soon again. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, Linda. I enjoyed it. Talk soon. Bye.